Okay, good morning everyone and welcome back to the second lecture on uh, BC213, the end times. Um, all right, um, any questions from anybody so far? Everything is okay? Um, Everybody's with me, okay. I, I'm, <clears throat> I'm seeing uh, Avni's question. Can we, okay, so Avni's question is, can we say persecution is one way God uses to purify the church? If yes, then what should be our perspective and prayer regarding persecution that is growing these days? Should we gladly embrace it or pray for it to be removed? Now, now uh, persecution, now, um, so yeah, try to I try to answer your question in <laughs> as 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 concisely as possible. Um, see, uh, let let's let's put it like this: persecution will always be there; it will never go away. Uh, Jesus said, "You will be hated by all men." for my name's sake, and he who endures to the end will be saved, meaning it's going to be there. It's never going to go away. Uh, you know, we're not going to, we can't pray it away. People are going to, uh, and, and, and Jesus told us in, you know, in John 17 especially, it's going to be because of his name's sake, right? Uh, and as long as we carry his name, there will be always those who oppose us. But we can learn from scripture the practical way to respond to persecution. So what do we see in scripture? One, Jesus told us to do what it takes to preserve our lives. He said, if they persecute you in one city, you go to the other. That means you do what you can to protect yourself. You know, Don't unnecessarily get killed. So be wise about it. He said, I'm sending you uh, as sheep among wolves, be harmless as doves, but be wise like serpents, meaning take care of yourself, walk with wisdom, right? So we do what we can. Secondly, there's nothing wrong to invoke uh, whatever civil rights we have to protect ourselves. The apostle Paul did it. Uh, he invoked his right as a Roman citizen when he was being persecuted uh, unjustly. Uh, third, we must make sure that we are not persecuted for the wrong reasons. And then Peter teaches us teaches this in First Peter 3. He says, you know, if you're persecuted for the name of Christ, that's good. But let nobody suffer as an evildoer. So there are Christians who do wrong and then they say they're being persecuted and that's foolishness. They're not being persecuted. They're being punished for their wrongdoing. So we need to differentiate between you know, persecuted, genuine persecution, and then persecution or facing the consequences of our wrongdoing. For example, if a Christian organization doesn't keep its records in place and the government revokes its permission, it's not persecution, it's punishment for not doing what you're supposed to be doing. But there are many people who, you know, who, who are actually being punished for not doing what they're supposed to do, and then they call it persecution. So we need to distinguish that. But in the midst of it, uh, if you know, if and when there is persecution, Peter tells us, you know, the spirit of glory rests upon you, and come to the joy to suffer honor for His name. To answer your question, so to answer your question, yes, we must do what it takes practically to protect our lives. Yes, we must do what it takes, practic uh, using civil means available to us to protect our lives. Uh, make sure we're not, or we're, not, we're not suffering punishment for wrongdoing. And if, having done all that, if you're still facing persecution, take it gladly, uh, count it an honor to suffer shame for his name. Okay, and yes, this is part of the way that God, you know, that the church is also uh, strengthened and encouraged. Okay, I hope I answered your question. A very concise way. Okay, so we're going to move forward. Uh, so what we were saying is, chapter two and three are the Lord's message to seven churches. Now, uh, and um, so the 
uh, I just want to say this, that there are some people who interpret chapters two and three as seven church ages. Uh, you know, uh, they say, okay, these seven churches actually represent seven church ages. And uh, I personally do not subscribe to that because the Lord was speaking to seven actual churches. He was not speaking about seven church ages. And he was talking about things that are not about. So the seven churches do not represent things of which are yet to come, but things that are. So the moment you take it out of its context, out of what the Lord gave it originally for, then you're actually going into territory you're not supposed to be going into. But there are people, even good Christian leaders, who interpret the seven churches as seven church ages, which, which technically is wrong because uh, these seven churches did exist in that time and therefore they fall within what Jesus called as things that are. So that's the way to leave it and just leave it there. But definitely we can learn something from each one of those seven churches. Okay, I'll, I'll, I see Kennedy's question. Compare Bema judgment, white throne, trumpet bowl, and nation search. But, all right, Kennedy. So as we journey through the book of Revelation, we're going to come into each one of these, right? But just to give you a quick idea, Bema judgment, which we refer to as uh, the judgment of the believer, of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. That is the judgment of the believer, which happens right after, this is in Revelation 4, right after the rapture of the church. White throne judgment happens in Revelation, the end of Revelation 20, which is at the end of the thousand year reign of Christ. Um, the, the judgment of the nations happens then, end of Revelation 20, when it says everybody will stand before him. Right? So that's the judgment of the nations. And then during the seven, year, seven years of tribulation, you have three sets of seven judgments. You have the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls. So those happen during the tribulation, okay? So uh, just to quickly review that in sequence, first, at, right after the rapture, there is the Bema judgment, which is the judgment of the believers in heaven. And it's a judgment for reward, not for salvation. During the tribulation, are three sets of seven judgments each. There are the seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls during the seven years of tribulation. At, after the tribulation, there's a thousand year reign of Christ. At the end of the thousand year reign of Christ, there is the great white throne judgment or the judgment of the nations at the end of the thousand year reign of Christ. Is that okay? We will, be, we will see that. We'll see the sequence here in, in the book of Revelation. Okay, so, so that is chapters 2 and 3. That means things that are. These seven churches were there and the Lord was giving a message to each one of the seven churches. Uh, just one other thing I want to point out is the reward he gave, he promised to each one of the seven churches is a reward in the future. Then he says, to him who overcomes... I will do this and this. It's very interesting that there, each one of those rewards are future tense. That means it's something out in the future, not something they would experience right then and there. There's corrective action, he tells each one of the seven churches, or almost all of them, to take right then and there. But the reward for the overcomer is out in the future. And it's very interesting to observe that because that reward is for all believers. It's not just for those seven churches, okay? So all believers are gonna participate in those rewards. It's basically prefixed by the statement, to him who overcomes, this is the reward. And so that's a reward we will all partake, all believe, believers will partake. Now, when you come to chapter four and five, what does John say? So John, uh, you know, he, he sees a door open and then basically he's looking into heaven. Right. So John is still in the spirit and in the spirit is like a door opens and he's like, OK, this is heaven, John. Come on in and see how, what it's like. And he sees God the Father seated on the throne. He sees Jesus as the Lamb of God. So the Lamb typifies Jesus Christ. So it doesn't mean there's a Lamb walking around in heaven in, in the throne room. No, that Lamb is signifying Jesus. So he sees the throne room. He sees God the Father. He sees Jesus typified by the Lamb. And he sees the Holy Spirit typified by the seven spirits of God. 
or in chapters 4 and 5, he refers to as the seven lamps of fire, the seven horns, or the seven eyes. These are figurative of the Holy Spirit. So basically in the throne room, he's saying God the Father who's being worshipped, and he's seeing Jesus, the, he's seeing the Lamb, which typifies Jesus Christ. And he sees the Holy Spirit, the presence of God, the presence of the Spirit of God, typified by the seven lamps, the seven horns, and the seven eyes. The seven lamps, the seven horns are on the Lamb, which means that the Lamb was anointed, right? Was empowered by the Holy Spirit. But th those, he says, are representing the seven spirits of God, the Holy Spirit. Okay. And then he sees worship happening. Now, he sees, of course, he sees angelic beings. He sees the cherubims worshiping, and he and he describes the cher <clears throat> He describes these angelic, <coughs> sorry, he describes these angelic beings. Who are worshiping God, holy, holy, holy. And uh, you know they they are they are proclaiming the holiness of God. But he also sees 24 elders. Now, what can we say about the 24 elders? First of all, they are seated on thrones. They are waiting, they are wearing white robes. They are wearing crowns. The question is, who are these 24 elders? Are they angelic beings? No, because then he would have referred to them as angels. But who are they? Well, these 24 elders are redeemed saints of God. How can we say that? Well, one, in the, in the book of Revelation, it's redeemed saints who are given white robes to wear, the robe of righteousness. Second, it is to his 12 apostles, Jesus said, you will be seat, seated with me on thrones. That's in Matthew 19, 28. So obviously one set of them are the 12 apostles. Third, it's the believer who receives crown for his reward. And these people are seated with crowns on the head. That's in uh, Revelation chapter four and verse four. They have their crowns of gold and they have white robes and they're seated on thrones, 24 thrones. Right. And then we also see over in Revelation 19, uh, in two references, Revelation 19, 10, and again in Revelation 22, uh, and um, uh, nine, Revelation 19, 10, and Revelation 22, 9, that when John falls down to worship one of these elders, he replies and says, don't worship me. I am one of your brethren and of your people. That means he says, I, I, I'm a Jewish man. So, so this is, you'll see this in Revelation 19 and uh, verse, let me give you the exact verse. Revelation 19, 10, yeah, he says, I am your fellow servant and of your brethren. And again, in Revelation 22 and verse 9, he says, I'm your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets. So he could have been an Old Testament prophet. Okay, so who are these 24 elders? Very clear that these are redeemed saints of God. The 12 of them are the apostles. Now we know that Judas was replaced by, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Judas was replaced, Acts chapter one. Matthias. Matthias. Uh, Matthias, Matthias, thank you. So Judas was replaced by Matthias. So Matthias will be sitting on the throne there. So, uh, so 12 of them we know are the 12 apostles. The other 12 are from the Old Testament saints, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. The reason we say that is because when you go over into chapter 22 of, uh, 
uh, and you see the new city, Jerusalem, uh, uh, Revelation 21 and 22, you find that the, the Revelation 21, the names of the 12 gates of the city, each gate is the 12, is the tri one tribe of Israel. And in the foundation are the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So both the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles are honored like this. So therefore, it's again, we conclude these 24 elders, just by all these scriptures that we've mentioned, are the 12 apostles of the Lamb and 12 Old Testament saints who represent each of the tribes of Israel. And they have received their rewards. They have the crowns, they have the white robes, they're seated on the throne. So we are saying that the Bema judgment has already taken place. That's Revelation chapter 4 and 5. Therefore, they are now, they have been ushered into their rewards in heaven. That means 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where everyone stands before the judgment seat of Christ, that is the Bema judgment and receives their reward has taken place. That's why they're wearing their crowns of gold and they are seated on the throne. So chapter four, chapters four and five is a scene of the throne room of heaven after the rapture has taken place. because the rewards have been given, our words have been given. And then in chapter five, one interesting thing happens. There is a shout in heaven saying, uh, uh, <clears throat> sorry, chapter five, God the Father is holding a scroll in his hand. And the scroll, has seven seals. That means it's perfectly sealed. Now it's very interesting, and we will look, look at this next year. In Daniel chapter 12, when angel Gabriel was speaking to Daniel, he said, Daniel, everything I've told you, it is sealed till the end of time. That means all these things I've told you about the end times, it is sealed. It's, it's held. It's like a pause button. Pressed. It is sealed till the end of time. Chapter 5, verse 1. God the Father is seated on the throne and he has a scroll in his right hand and it has seven seals, meaning it's perfectly sealed. And then there's an angel crying out saying, Who can open the seal? That means all these things are the things waiting to be fulfilled. Who is going to unlock them and start the fulfillment of these things? Who is worthy to do that? And Jesus comes up. He's typified by the lamb who has seven horns and seven eyes. That's representing the seven spirits of God. That means the lamb who was anointed by the Holy Spirit. He comes and then everybody says, there is only one. This is Revelation chapter 5 verse 5. Only one who is qualified to open the seal. That is the Lamb of God, the Root of David, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. So he comes and then it says here, he takes the Lamb and he opens the scroll. That's figurative of these things are going to start being fulfilled. So that's chapter 5, the scene in heaven, the throne room. So what we are saying is, this is going to happen. It has not yet happened, but it's going to happen. And as he opens the first seal, so now we go to chapter six. Okay, are you with me so far? So Jesus begins to open the scroll, uh, unseal it and open it. So it's the beginning of the fulfillment of the things that are prepared for the end of time. And Jesus, so that means Revelation 4 and 5, 
Rapture has taken place. Rewards have been given. The 24 elders are around. Every worship is going on in heaven. And at that time, Jesus begins to open the seals. The scroll representing things that are going to take place. You will see once again in chapter chapter the chapter 14, I think it is, that um, uh, John is made uh, to eat a scroll. Wait a second. Uh, sorry, is it? Yeah, chapter. It is the intermission chapter. Chapter. Uh, Okay, and I can't remember this offhand. Is it, um, okay, chapter chapter ten. Sorry. So, in chapter ten, we will see once again that uh, John is given a little book. Chapter ten, a little book to eat, and uh, that is uh, it. Has it is basically saying, okay, now you're going to speak out all of these prophecies. So the scroll and the book are basically indicating to us that all these prophecies are going to start happening. Okay, so that's chapter five. So as the Lord begins to open the seal, things start happening here on earth. So this is chapter, Revelation chapter six. So Revelation chapter 6, so Revelation 4 and 5 is about the scene in heaven, the throne room. Revelation chapter 6 verse 1 is what is happening here on earth at the start of the tribulation. So as Jesus opens the first seal, uh, John is saying, John is invited to come and see. So obviously, he is seeing things. The first seal opens, what happens? So let me just summarize chapter six. So Revelation six, I think we will finish chapter six and pause, okay? So in Revelation chapter six, we see in the first four seals, very interesting, there's a horse involved. A horse. Again, the horse is symbolic of something that happens very quickly uh, with speed and with strength. And each one of those first four seals, uh, actually all, all, all six of the seals, uh, represent something happening on the earth. Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. The first seal is opened and you see a man uh, on a white horse and he is given a bow and a crown to go about conquering and to conquer. Now who is this man on a white horse who's going about conquering and conquer? Now, we have only, either he's the Christ or he's the Antichrist. But Christ comes in Revelation 19, riding on a white horse, but he comes in great power and great glory. So Revelation 6, 1 is the Antichrist. He's a copy. He's not the real Christ. But he is given, I mean, he's permitted to have this authority and he goes about conquering and to conquer that means he is moving with strength and speed and he's ex extending his influence over the nations so revelation 6 1 begins with the unveiling of this man of sin the son of perdition the antichrist who comes riding on a white horse some you know comes as a man of peace but he's gaining power and influence on the earth. 
The next horse, verse 3, Revelation 6, 3, when the second seal is broken, there's a red horse. What does it symbolize? It says there in verse 4, Revelation 6, verse 4, people start killing one another. There is great destruction. People are killing. So there's killing on the earth. So when the second seal is broken, there's a lot of killing on the earth, killing one another. Peace is taken off from the earth. The third seal, a black horse. What does this represent? It represents famine. Because you read in Revelation 6 and verse 6, it's talking about wheat, oil, and wine being sold for a high price. It says, don't even touch it. You can't even touch it. So it's talking about scarcity of supply, of food supply, wheat, oil, and wine. The fourth seal, it's a pale horse. This is Revelation 6 and verse 7. And this talks about death. And he says then, verse 8, one fourth of the earth, that means 25% of earth's population, will die. They'll die due to one of these things. What? They'll be killed with a sword, with hunger, scarcity of food, or something, whatever is going to cause death, and by the beasts of the earth. That means wild animals are going to begin to invade our cities. And it's very interesting that you read in the news time to time, you know, that we man in our cities, we've actually encroached on <laughs> into the habitation of these animals. And these animals are now, you know, showing up in cities, leopards and tigers and whatever, but they're being killed by the beasts of the earth. So there's the fourth seal. It's destruction. There's death to the point where 25%, a fourth of the earth is killed. A fourth of the world's population die. The fifth seal tells us about martyrs. It says verse 9, when he opens the fifth seal, I see the souls of those who have been killed for the word of God and for the testimony they held. So here we see very clearly, this is the first key, first time it's mentioned. During the tribulation, this is just the start of the tribulation. There are going to be souls who are killed for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And so, there's a loud voice, Revelation 6, 10, you know, Lord, how long is this going to go on for? When are you going to avenge the blood of the people who are being martyred? Verse 11, a white robe was given to each one of them. So remember I told you earlier, the white robe is given to the saints of God. So it's right here, Revelation 6, 11, a white robe was given to each of them. But then he says, this is going to go on their fellow servants and the brethren who would be killed. That means more and more people are still going to be killed during the tribulation. Revelation 6 verse 11. Their fellow servants and their brethren would be killed. So he says you wait because more people are going to die. So that means there will be believers during the tribulation. There will be people who are serving God during the tribulation. They will turn to God. They will be you know, they, like it refers to them as servants of God. For they have been killed for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. That means they're going to proclaim, they're going to talk about Jesus, but they're going to die, they're going to be killed. So will there be believers during the tribulation? Yes. Will they be preaching about Jesus? Yes. So will they be empowered by the Holy Spirit? Yes. Will they be martyred? Yes. That is under the fifth seal, we see that. And the sixth seal, Revelation 6 verse 12, so when the Lord opens the sixth seal, there is catastrophic, cataclysmic events. As the earthquake, the sun becomes black, the moon becomes like blood, the stars of the heaven fall to the earth, and the sky is just you know affected. 
And this is so much like what Joel prophesied. Joel chapter 2 verse 28. He said, you know, I will pour out my spirit. The sun will be darkened. The moon will become blood red. And I will show signs in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Revelation 6, 12 is one part of the fulfillment. If you see it again and happening in chapter 8 and verse 12. Okay, so these cataclysmic events in the earth and in the cosmic system is so great. It says, verse 15, the Pastor, we can hear you. All right, sorry. Um, yeah, we have been having these airtel problems here. So um, I stopped when I was saying, uh, I think I lost connection when I was saying, wow. Right. Is that where I lost connection? Uh, it's like the tribulation is going to be so, so great. I mean, okay. catastrophic events there, Pastor. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Prabhakar. All right, can you all hear me now? Uh, am I back? Uh, you can all hear me. Okay, fine. All right, so what we were saying was, Revelation 6, 12 um, onwards, there are gonna be these signs in heaven and so on, and verse 15, you know, these, these rich, the, the, the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, uh, they, you know, educated, uneducated, everyone is going to say, you know, we are actually experiencing the wrath of the Lamb. Revelation chapter 6, verse 16. They're going to recognize that this is God's judgment. Okay, that means, hey, we are in a time that we are facing up to God. Revelation 6, 16. This is the day of His wrath. Okay. This is what is happening now. It's the time of the wrath of the Lamb of God, meaning it's the time of God's judgment. People are going to realize that. Okay, so by the time you reach the sixth seal, it's like people are gonna, you know, get shocked, They're gonna wake up and what's going on? This is out of hand. Now, you know, so I wanna just make this comment. So, so you know, the last two years we've seen a pandemic and uh, we're just coming out of it. Uh, a, a, a lot of, you know, a lo lot of people have lost lives, but it's nothing compared to what we're seeing here. Revelation 6, 8, 25% of the earth's population will die. And more. So we're talking about, you know, almost uh, more than 2 billion people. 
right? 25, at least, I'm just approximately saying that that's how great this devastation is going to be. And it's going to make people realize this is the wrath of the Lamb. And this is the day, great day of His wrath, Revelation 6, verse 17. Okay? And then Revelation 7, uh, 7, verse 1, or, you know, um, the sixth seal is actually in chapter 8, verse 1. Uh, we will get to that. That's basically a time of silence in heaven. We'll, we'll get to it. But let us stop here uh, to the end of chapter 6. Okay? Uh, we will pick this up next week. But to quickly review, and then if you have any questions, we can take it. After the Lord has given the message to the seven churches, which were existing at that time, which was around AD 90. He takes John into things that are yet to come, that are going to happen. And the first vision, part of the vision is the throne room. That is chapters four and five. And in the first part of that, he sees God the Father, the Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit. And he sees 24 elders. I mean, he sees the angelic beings worshiping and he sees 24 elders who are also joining in worship. But what we note in chapter four is that these 24 elders are clothed in white robe. They have received the crowns. They're seated on the throne. And later on, we know that one of these elders in Revelation 19.10 and another elder in Revelation 22.10 Nine, identifies himself as I'm one of your brethren and of your people and of your prof one of your prophets. So, you know, we conclude based on this and what we see in Revelation 21, 22, that there are these 12 apostles of the Lamb, 12 prophets of the old who are seated around the throne. They make up the 24 elders and they have received their rewards, their crowns, and they are seated on their thrones. Therefore, the judgment of saints has taken place. They have received all the rewards. Then chapter five is the scene in the throne room of heaven. The God the Father has a scroll in his hand, meaning these are prophecies that have been sealed up, waiting to be fulfilled. Who can say that it's not being fulfilled? Who has the authority to do that? And there's only one. It's the anointed Lamb of God, Jesus. So he comes, he takes the scroll. And there's great, you know, worship going on in heaven, worshiping the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And chapter 6, verse 1 onwards, the seals are being opened, meaning the prophecies are beginning to be fulfilled. And so in chapter 6, the first six seals uh, are fulfilled here on earth. The first four are typified by each one is defined by a horse. Horse meaning something that happens with strength and speed. So it's not like a literal horse coming and riding on the earth. It's just saying something happens very quickly. Very strong, very quickly. What happens? Well, first there's this man who comes on a white horse. He comes as a man of peace and he conquers. Meaning he gets influence and power. This is the Antichrist. It happens very fast and happens very strong. But then, right after he comes into power, things just start getting bad. Uh, the next seal is that people start fighting with each other. The next thing you see is there is famine, lack, scarcity of food and supply. And the fourth seal is there's death everywhere. 25% of the world, people are dying. Either they die because of the killing, they die because of famine, or they die because death comes upon them in some way, or they're even wild animals that destroy people. And then the fifth seal is there are a lot of people being killed for the name of Jesus Christ. And it's not over. He said there are more people who are going to be dying. It's going to go on. The sixth seal are these catastrophic cosmic events and events on the earth. There's great earthquake. Sun becomes black, the moon turns into blood. Uh, there are meteors falling from the sky, and it just is very devastating. 
it shakes people up. And then it says that everybody on the earth, rich and poor, educated and uneducated, everybody like, understands how we are in the day of God's judgment, the judgment of the Lamb of God. They recognize it. Okay. So today we've just given a high overview till chapter six. Uh, any questions before we dismiss? We've got about six minutes. Um, any questions? Shri Kumar, go ahead. Thank you, Pastor. Pastor, uh, I have a question on uh, this 24 elders. Um, as you said uh, that, um, you know, 12 will be the apostles and the 12 will be the 12 tribes of Israel. It will be in that way, the 24 elders will be counted. So my question is this, that, uh, um, so what about those people like Enoch, Abraham, Noah, because they were not um, in the, uh, even able, uh, they were not in the, in the 12 tribes of, uh, you know, of Israel, they were they were the patriarchs. So, what will be their position? That is one question. And my another question is this: um, that what will happen to those childrens um, um, at the time of um, you know uh, the parents who will who have this mark of beast and uh, they will have children. So, will they able to? Uh, they will be. Are they will be in a position to those childrens? Are they they will be in the position to receive Christ because they were not knowing about what what is happening? You know, you know. So in those in those in that case, how the God will going to judge those children who are going to um, you know uh, uh, come at that in this in the season of this tribulation and after the rapture? So how they will come to Christ or whether they can able to come to Christ. Uh, that's my question because of the, the mark of the beast is controlling them. So that's two questions I have. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. So to answer your first question, see, we don't know exactly who these 12 Old Testament saints are. We don't know. Uh, there are only 12 thrones and uh, there are many Old Testament, uh, you know, uh, people that we could think of. I will just let God decide. Uh, the reason I mentioned the 12 tribes is because of how the 12 tribes are honored um, uh, by, um, you know, the, uh, the names of the 12 tribes are written on the gates of the city of the New Jerusalem. Now, if, you know, the Lord wants Abraham to be there or Noah to be there on one of the throne or you know, Abel or somebody other than one of the 12 tribes. I mean, we just leave it to God. I don't know. I'm just saying this is what we think, right? I mean, uh, that the 12, we know Jesus spoke to the 12 apostles. But because one of them, one of the elders said, I am one of your prof of your prophets. So we are saying, yeah, it's somebody from the Old Testament. We don't exactly. And we just leave it open, I think. <laughs> Because he's honored the 12 tribes that way, maybe it's one from the 12 tribes, maybe not, but probably, you know, from the Old Testament, you know, saints. Uh, yeah, to what extent we know we've said it, but we'll just leave it open, yeah. The second question, the answer to your second part is, you know, uh, God will deal with the children just as he deals with children today. That is until they come to that place where they can know for themselves the truth you know, and make a decision. Uh, they are in their age of innocence. And so if they die early, before they could make a decision, they will definitely go to heaven. Uh, so he will deal with the children just the way he does today as well, like we said. Okay. All right, uh, say if right. you have a quick quick question, we'll try to do it in two minutes. Yeah, yeah Pastor, I, I wasn't really clear about the um, 24 elders, are you saying to the representative of the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles? If so, John was still alive when the elders were in heaven. So I'm just wondering if if that is it, or maybe I didn't catch that very well, sorry. Yeah, so what we are saying is, 
um, chapter four and five are things yet to come. Right? They're not okay. things that were happening when John was seeing it. It was things yet to come. So we're saying chapter four and five is the scene after the, the rapture of the church and the elders are around the throne and Christ begins to open the seal. So it is in the future, literally maybe 2000 years from the time of John. So surely John would be have would be in heaven by the time and he would be one of the 12 apostles seated on the throne. Now, you know, I don't want to say that we know for sure these 12 are the 12 apostles and the 12 are 12, you know, Old Testament says. The answer is we don't know. The only thing we can say for sure is that these elders are redeemed saints because they are identical. Okay. One of the elders says, you know, I was, uh, I'm of your brethren. That means he's Jewish. Uh, I am your fellow servant. That means he was a servant of God. And in Revelation 22 to 9, he says, I'm of the prophets. So most likely he's talking about the Old Testament prophets. So that's the information we do have, which we can say for certain. The reason I said uh, it could be the 12 apostles and the 12 tribes is because uh, that's these tw the 12 apostles and 12 tribes are honored by God um, in, uh, in, uh, in the, the new city, Jerusalem. And secondly, also in Revelation uh, 19, uh, 28, Jesus did tell the 12 apostles, you will be seated with me on thrones. So it's because of that, you know, we arrive at this inference. But if the Lord wants to do something different, it's okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. All right. Thank you. Um, Divya, I know you've raised your hand, uh, but can we do your question next week? Sure, sure, Pastor. <clears throat> Please remember to uh, ask your question. Uh, okay, it's... Um, all right, so let's close. Uh, I hope uh, you know, these things are coming through clearly. If you have questions, we'll definitely pick them up next week. And so we're going through the book of Revelation chronologically to see the sequence of events that they unfold. Uh, it's at high level, so don't worry if you're not getting the details. We will do it when we read verse by verse next year. Okay, could somebody please close in prayer and dismiss us so we can take our break and go for Oh, actually, we don't have to hurry, right? It's the end of the class. Oh, I was thinking there's one more hour here after this. Okay, you want to ask a question? Is your question short? Yes. Yes, Master. Uh, I, uh, my question is regarding, uh, since uh, it is mentioned about what's happening on Earth uh, in chapters 4 to 19, so is the Bible uh, silent about what is happening in heaven during this time? Or does it does it give a glimpse into it as well? Yeah, so chapters four and five, we said it's what's happening in heaven, right? Four and five. Six onwards is happening here on earth. Uh, but John is seeing both heaven and earth. You know, he's seeing what's happening. Um, what we have said earlier is when we listed out all the things that will happen in heaven after the, after the rapture, right? So all those things are happening in heaven, that is, our believers are, you know, the mansions, they're in worship. Um, and um, uh, there is the marriage supper of the Lamb, Revelation 19. So all that's happening. Uh, so from chapter 6, the focus is on earth. But John does see what's happening in heaven and on earth. He's going up and down, meaning he sees something in heaven, something on earth. Uh, but the focus is on the events that are happening on earth. So chapter 4 and 5 is what's happening in heaven. Chapter 6, things on earth earth chapter seven again he sees something that's happening on earth chapter eight he goes up into heaven so it's like back and forth but essentially we get a sequence of events that are happening on earth so to answer your question it's actually like a back and forth but really a lot of the things are of things on earth okay okay Pastor. thank you yeah. thank you so much okay all right let's wrap up for today somebody could pray and then we'll dismiss i know we've taken a few minutes extra but Somebody could pray and we will go. Go ahead. All right, Abraham, why don't you pray, please? 
Yeah, okay, Pastor. All right, let's pray. Oh, precious Father, we thank you for all we have learned. We thank you for all you taught us today. Father, we have been hearers of your word, and we want to be doers of your word. Father, we pray that even as we leave this class, may your grace and your wisdom continue to be with us, that we will apply this knowledge in our daily life, that we'll be conscious of your coming, we'll be conscious of the end time, that every step that we take will be in line with the gospel, will be in line in accordance to your word. Father, we thank you for a successful class. In the name of Jesus, we have time. Amen. Amen. Okay, everyone, uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, God bless. Yeah. See you soon. Thank, Thank you, you, Pastor. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank God you, Pastor. Bless. God bless. God bless. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. See you again. Thank God you. bless you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. God bless. Yeah.